Hello, you 10. So in your last lesson, you should have watched a documentary on the romantic poets, which a few of you may have seen before, where you were given key information about Keats, um, Shelley and Byron. Today, we are going to be looking at a poem by John Keats called To Autumn. But first, we're going to recall some vo vocabulary. So in our last video lesson, we looked at um, living space and London, and we looked at comparing the two. And we talked about how both poems have this theme of confinement, but they choose to present this theme in different ways. So what I'd like you to do is recall what it means um, to be confined or to confine somebody. And how does Darker, the poet, show the people who live in the slums don't let their confined lives make them miserable? If you can pause the video, please, and answer that question. Now, our new word today is an elegy. Now, an elegy is a poem of serious reflection, typically a lament, a mourning for the dead. So can you please pause the video and write that down? This word is incredibly important um, to the poem we will be studying today. So pause the video, please, and write down that definition. So using what we now know about an elegy, from what do you know about the romantic poets? Why might they choose to write an elegy? What sort of things may the romantic poets choose to write an elegy about? What sorts of things may they lament or may they mourn for based on your knowledge of their beliefs? So then, some answers. Hopefully you've paused the video and answered these two questions yourself first. To confine somebody means to restrict them. Now, this can be a literal confinement through being chained, through being imprisoned, or you can be confined, restricted due to your circumstances. So the people in the slums aren't physically confined in that they're not chained to a wall but they are restricted because of the, the slums, the shanty towns in which they have to live in. That living situation does affect their lives and potentially the quality of their lives and their opportunities. However, as we know, Darker shows us by the end of this poem that this sympathetic, pitiful Western perspective we can sometimes have um, of people in less developed countries to our own. When we look at the images of the slums and sort of instantly pity these people, that is not the reaction she wants us to have by the end of the poem. She wants to change our cultural perspective and actually view these people as very brave because they have the faith and hope um, that they can just continue on living and doing their best by themselves and their families despite the restrictions in which they live under. So we are supposed to admire them. Um, and their resilience and their strength by the end of the poem. So the Romantic poets were fascinated by death in many ways. Um, the earlier Romantic poets, people like Blake and William Wordsworth, who the first documentary would have mentioned and who we're going to focus on um, next after today's poem, because they were Christian and did have religious beliefs, they were very interested in this idea of, of death and what happens to your sort of your soul really in the afterlife. Equally, they could have written an elegy based on the ills of sort of modern society, this idea of the Industrial Revolution, um, which they were very against, and the sort of negative impact that they had had. Their poems often are very mournful and they long for these good old days before the Industrial Revolution when everyone lived in little villages and towns and they present these very romanticised images of what life used to be like in the distant past before the rise of science and technology. So they very much mourned the way modern, what they viewed as modern society was going. The later generation romantic poets, so the Shelley, Keats, Byron, um, who you looked at in yesterday's documentary, they, because a lot of them were losing their religious faith, um, and they were obviously looking to think about, well, what happened when we die? And because they no longer believed in, in heaven or this afterlife, the concept of death could be one that 
was quite frightening to them, or at least something that concerned and preoccupied them a lot because they didn't know what happened or when you died. And they were obsessed with this idea of immortality and the fact that you only achieved immortality living forever through your art, through your poetry. There was often this very romantic idea as well about dying young and the romanticism in sort of um, the legacy that it gives your your figure, your person and your poetry if you died young or experienced sort of tragic circumstances, if you like. So, you know, the way to view these later ro romantic poets is very much like the sort of stereotypical live hard, die young sort of rock stars or actors you know that you see um in sort of our society so they did have this sort of fascination and, and romanticized death quite a lot and we see this sort of fascination with death in today's poem so we're going to analyze and evaluate how keats uses language to explore ideas about nature into your autumn so we're going to develop our understanding about john keats and who he was we're going to think about what ideas that he's exploring into autumn and how he uses language form that should be in structure to present these ideas. So quickly pause the video and write down your knowledge goal to analyse and evaluate how Keats uses language to explore ideas about nature into autumn. So the first thing we're going to do, this is short, it's about six minutes, is we're just going to watch a short documentary which is focused on, um, more specifically on Keats, and it will add to what you learnt in yesterday's lesson. So hopefully this should switch over now. In a leafy cemetery just outside the centre of Rome lies the grave of the English poet John Keats. He is buried in a quiet corner hidden from the bustle of the city in which he died in 1821. He spent the last days of his life broken hearted, desperately ill and concerned that he had failed in his quest to become one of the great English poets. He asked for his epitaph to read, here lies one whose name was writ in water because he believed that his legacy would be washed away by time. So why was Keats buried here, over a thousand miles from home and beneath his own declaration that he was forgettable, unremarkable, a first class failure? This video will cover the crucial elements of his life and legacy, from his personal troubles to his veneration as a key figure of the Romantic movement. The name John Keats has not been washed away at all. So meet Keats. Born in London in 1795, he grew little above five foot tall and was described to have auburn hair and large expressive eyes. He had a reputation for fighting at school, was loyal and sensitive by nature and retained a sense of humour in spite of great personal woe. Almost every aspect of his life was riddled with tragedy. First, his family was plagued by a series of misfortunes. By the time that Keats had turned 15, his brother Edward had died during infancy, his father had perished in a riding accident, and his mother had been lost to tuberculosis, a contagious disease that was commonly known as consumption and that was little understood at the time. The disease typically attacks the lungs, causing the victim to cough blood, grow skeletal and pale, and suffer from feverish sweats. In 1818, consumption also claimed the youngest of Keats's brothers, Tom. The same year had already seen the family disperse when George emigrated to America to etch out a new life as a businessman. Keats thus watched almost all of his immediate relatives move to a far away part of the world or out of the world altogether. Yet Keats was not only beset by familial difficulties, but by professional ones. He racked up enormous bills training to become a doctor, only to dedicate his life to poetry instead. The trouble was that his poetry was not particularly well received. Although Keats was admired by a handful of supporters, his work was ripped apart in some of the most eminent periodicals of the day. A particularly scathing review described Endymion as unintelligible, diffuse, tiresome and absurd, and Keats and his friends were mocked as the Cockney School of Poetry. They were not from the upper classes of society or the hallowed halls of Oxbridge and were sneered at 
as uncouth upstarts. As a derided poet struggling to make ends meet, Keats was not exactly prime husband material. He fell desperately in love with his neighbour, Fanny Braun, a realist with a feisty wit, a flirtatious strain and a taste for fashionable clothes. By the end of 1819, the two were engaged, but their marriage was little more than a pipe dream. Braun was expected to find a husband with the monetary means to support her, and Keats was not in a position of financial stability. And he never would be. Like his mother and brother before him, Keats fell victim to consumption. He travelled to Rome in the vain hope that the warm weather would salvage his health, but to no avail. He died at the age of 25, having seen his relatives pass away, his work condemned by the critics, and his prospects of marriage blasted. The year before, he had written the following in a letter to Braun. If I should die, I have left no immortal work behind me, nothing to make my friends proud of my memory, but I have loved the principle of beauty in all things. And if I had had time, I would have made myself remembered. So did anything positive come out of all this misery? Well, the events of Keats's lifetime helped to shape some of his most moving and enduring poetry. Although it would be reductive to read his work simply in biographical terms, there is no doubt that his life haunts his verse. Take Ode to a Nightingale, for instance, where the description of youth growing pale and spectre-thin echoes the effects of consumption that Keats witnessed firsthand. Or Lamia, where the references to classical mythology are piled on top of each other, as if Keats was keen to show himself equal to any Oxbridge-educated peer. The difficulties of Keats's life therefore appear to have impacted his poetry, poetry that is celebrated today as some of the finest, in English literature. We now regard Keats as one of the key romantic poets. That's not romantic with a small r as in Valentine's Day and Walks on the Beach, but romantic with a capital R as in the wider movement known as Romanticism. This movement was a set of artistic, literary and intellectual tastes that swept across Europe, seemingly in a knee-jerk reaction to the Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment of the 18th century was about reason. It was a period in which science was popularised and rational thought was promoted as an alternative to religious dogma. The men of the Enlightenment sought to illuminate the mysteries of the universe. The Romantics, on the other hand, revelled in the mysteries. They detested the idea of squashing the world down into fact and equations, instead believing in the power of the imagination. They sought beauty for beauty's sake and desired to lose themselves in the natural world in the ambiguous, majestic, transcendent. These qualities are reflected in Keats's poetry. Alongside Byron and Percy Shelley, he is known as a second generation romantic poet, the first generation consisting of William Wordsworth, Coleridge and Blake. It is important to note that none of these figures would have seen themselves as romantic poets because the term is a retrospective one that we use to group together similar writers. In Keats's poetry, we find the sensual imagery of romanticism, and he even gave the movement one of its most famous maxims. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. If only he knew that one day those words would be found on anything, from mugs to t-shirts to classroom walls. To summarise, Keats was plagued by grief, criticism, heartbreak and ill health, yet from such misery came the beauty of his words. His poems drew upon the depth of feeling that he had experienced, and in doing so, those poems became part of the enduring legacy of Romanticism. In a flash of uncharacteristic faith and self-assurance, Keats had once written to his brother, I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. Although he came to believe that his name was writ in water, his younger self was closer to the mark. Keats's memory has been preserved in stone, in film, in paint, and even in this video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and look out for upcoming material on Keats's poetry. So, hopefully a lot of that wasn't unfamiliar to you because you would have um, heard a lot of it in the documentary that you watched yesterday. So, what we're going to do now
is we are going to annotate um, the poem. So, oh, sorry, give me a second to just make sure that appears on your screen. So, as always, we're going to include a little bit of context. Now, you would have hopefully already made some notes on the context, but he, here are some of the key things. So, he was a second generation romantic poet. We know he trained as a surgeon, but gave it up because it was too brutal. He couldn't handle operating on people without anaesthetic. We know he experienced lots of personal tragedy, lost his mum, dad and brother. He was unlucky in love and critics didn't like his poetry, at least not when he was alive. He died age 25. Um, the poem was written when he was ill. It's important to note he didn't know for sure he was dying when he wrote this poem. OK, he wasn't sure he was going to die, but he would have had enough medical training to know that he was quite poorly indeed. And he did eventually die of tuberculosis. Now, before we read this poem, I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of a life cycle. Because to understand this poem, we have to understand this idea of a life cycle. Now, you don't have to write this down or anything. I'm just trying to visually explain my point. Now, everything in life is a cycle, essentially. Um, our whole existence is essentially going around in this big circle with the seasons. But equally, we refer, refer to this idea of, of the cycle of life. So we have birth, childhoods, adulthoods, middle age, old age, and then eventually death. And this is a cycle none of us can escape from. It is the universal truth of every living thing on this earth that we are born, we live and we die. What we do not know, of course, is when our death is going to come. And poor Keats didn't get to experience the rest of his life as he died in his early adulthood. Now, what we also have linking into this in an, on a sort of another level, really, is the seasons is a cycle as well. And what we can do is we can link the um, sort of seasons, really. So that says this, not but. Um, we can link the seasons to being symbolic or representing the life cycle. And that's really the key to understanding this quite long poem. So birth. We have spring. Spring is associated with new life. Rebirth. 
So spring very much symbolizes or represents birth. What we have, you know, spring is really sort of birth and childhood, if you like. What we then have is summer. The summer of your life is very much your adulthood into, you know, middle age, being in, you know, the sort of prime of your life, really, which is what probably about your 40s. What we then have from middle age into old age is this idea of autumn, the autumn of your life, you know, where your adulthood has passed you by, you're sort of retired, maybe. And finally, what we have, what we're currently stuck in now, is this idea of winter. So we've got two cycles going on here, the cycle of life, the existence of every living thing on earth, and then symbolising each of these stages comes the cycle of the seasons. Now, Interestingly, this poem is called To Autumn. So what we can assume is that the focus of this poem is not on this first half of life, birth, childhood, adulthood. Instead, what this poem is about is our middle to old age and likely death by the end. So we have these three sections here, middle age, old age and death. We've got this representation of autumn and winter that we can link to these stages in life. And we've got this idea of circles. And in the seasons, we're currently everything's dead. You know, the leaves are, are off the trees, the flowers are dead. But we know in a few months time, it will be spring. There will be leaves on the trees. The flowers will unfurl. The lambs will be born. Daffodils will be everywhere. The weather will get warmer. And this cycle of birth will begin again to eventually culminate in death. And year in, year out, this is our existence. Now, to understand the poem, you need to keep all of this sort of in your mind. So that's back of living space. So to awesome. Now, I know this poem looks a little bit long and intimidating. We're not going to be writing about every single line of this poem. OK, because we'll be here forever. So, as always, we start with our title, To Autumn. Now, this is an ode. An ode, sorry, you'll see this in a minute, is where you write a poem to a thing or object. So it's a poem written to the season of autumn. So I'll try and it gets a bit better. What he's also using is personification. Autumn is being presented as a person. And we see this personification of autumn as a person. He's writing this poem to autumn as something that happens throughout. Remember, at any point, you could pause the video if my annotation is moving a little bit fast for you. So we can see here we have three stanzas and each of these three stanzas represents a different part of the season, the life cycle of the seasons and a different part of the life cycle of um, the sort of, of a human. So we're going to read the poem and then down this side, we're just going to write the sort of season and stage of life that's linked to each um, stanza. And here we'll write some analysis of the language. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. So he's talking about autumn. Autumn is the season of fruitfulness. Now, fruitfulness, all the fruit, veg, crops are ripe ready to be picked. They're fully grown, fully mature. So seas autumn is a season of plenty of fruitfulness, of all your hard work over the summer, planting and watering your crops 
finally they're ripe and ready and fruitful. And he goes on and on in this stanza, really, about this idea of the fruitfulness or ripeness of all these um, crops. Close bosom friend of the maturing sun. Now, we've got more personification of um, the sun here. But what's quite interesting is that he's hinting at old age and even death here because the sun is maturing. And if something is maturing and getting older, we know that inevitably death lies at the end. So there's just a little glimmer of negativity here. But, you know, autumn is a close bosom friend to the sun because, of course, without the sun, you have none of the fruit, the vegetables, the crops. The sun is essential um, to all life. Conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run. So what we have here, thatch eaves run, is um, think about like the old, really old fashioned cottages that look like they have um, roofs made of straw. That's what we mean by thatched eaves run. So what Keats is doing here is he's presenting an image of the fact that the sun and autumn have conspired, have got together to create all of these luscious, ripe vines of fruit linking uh, their way round this idyllic, beautiful little old fashioned country cottage. So it's a very romantic image. You know, here of an old fashioned cottage laden down with fruit. To bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd, that's just a type of um, vegetable, plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, set budding more and still more, later flowers for the bees. So what we have here, and we're going to write about sort of all of this together, is he's describing... all of the ripe fruit and veg and blooming flowers. So he's creating this very idyllic, very beautiful country pastoral rural image, which is unsurprising considering he is considered to be a romantic poet who, as we know, their ideal was this beautiful country setting. But it's this idea of ripeness, the ripeness of the fruit, the vegetables um, ready for the ready to be picked. Until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Now we have another little sliver of negativity here. You know, um, it's this idea that when you're younger or sort of healthier, you feel you'll be that way forever. It's, you know, this perception of, of youth or younger people as if they're sort of immortal and nothing will ever change. So it's as if these warm, perfect days will never cease, will never end. Now, what we have here in our little life cycle is we have this idea of old age into middle age. So, you know, we're talking sort of, I don't know, 40s, really. So what we have here is middle age, this idea of being in the sort of prime of life. And that's represented by sort of early autumn. So think September, you know, in September, it feels that summer is still there. 
So we have all of these associations with, I don't know, adulthood going into as autumn progresses, this more sort of middle age. But this idea of being the, in the prime of your life, you know, healthy, robust, successful, powerful, confident, you know, by the time you get into later adulthood, you should hopefully, you know, be settled, have found your place in the world. So we have all of this ripe fruit symbolising or linking into this stage of life. And that's represented through this season of early autumn. So what we see here is we're moving into, you know, this sort of retirement, old age, represented by sort of later autumn. Really, by the time you get to retirement, you should be able to enjoy the benefits of everything that you've um, done in life. Um, that's sort of the period of your life you should be in. And we see that reflected in the stanza. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? So um, what he's doing here is he is continuing to personify um, autumn. But what he's doing is he's personifying autumn as a woman throughout this stanza. So who hasn't seen you often in thy store? Now, store would be where people would keep all of their harvested crops and fruits and vegetables to last them through the winter. Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor. So you have to imagine autumn as a woman here, sitting again on the floor of a sort of granary, which I believe is where flour is sort of ground. So again, careless, linking into this idea of retirement. All the hard work of your, the harvest of your life is over. You can now enjoy yourself, relax. Thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Again, we have a very um, romantic image of, you know, this autumn as a woman with her hair in the soft wind or on a half reaped furrow sound asleep. That's just like um, a big pile of hay. Drowsed with the fume of poppies. While thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. So hook would be used to cut down the crops. Sometimes, like a gleaner, that's a boat, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, a, a lake. Or by a cider press with patient looks, thou watched the last oozings hour by hour. Now, I haven't written about these lines because really it's just this layering of very lazy, very relaxed, very calm images. You know, you're having a little sleep on a pile of hay that you've just cut down um, in the fields. You know, you've just reaped that. You're calmly enjoying lazing on a boat as it goes down a lovely, beautiful, glittering river. So it's this repetition, again, linking into this idea of retirement or old age. This time, all the hard work's done. Now you can relax. Now, this final bit here, now watch the last oozings hour by hour, is that we're hinting again at death. It's the last oozings that actually death is only around the corner because essentially our hours, our time is an infinite and we know that eventually um, death is what waits for us. And then finally, what we have here is old age into death, represented by the coming of winter. Where are the songs of spring? I, where are they? Now, what we have here is this sort of rhetorical question 
thinking back, you know, it's in the last days of your life, you think back to the spring of your life, your childhood, your youth. So where are the songs? Where are these memories? But then he gives himself this advice. Think not of then, thou hast thy music too. So he's saying here, there's beauty in death too. And we see that here by this very soft, gentle passing that he describes. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble panes with a rosy hue. So what we have here is the sunset over a harvested field. So again, sunset, day into night, life into death. We've even got this cycle there to layer upon our other two cycles of day into night, day being birth, you know, night being death. So we've got this rosy, you know, red glowing orangey hue of a sunset. Then in a wailful choir, small gnats mourn among the river sallows. So what we have here is we have some sort of sensory imagery of what he can hear. Or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And full grown lambs, loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from the garden croft. Now what we have here is we have animals singing a sad, almost funeral song. You know, a choir is a group of people singing together. So essentially what these animals are doing as, you know, a person or this person passes into death is they're almost singing them on their way. We have, you know, these gnats that are full grown lambs. So again, this idea of the passing of time, the lamb, which would have been a baby in spring is now full grown by winter. We have hedge crickets. We have the treble, the, the song of a robin. So this very sort of sensory image of all of these very natural sounds um, combining together to almost sing this person off as they gently die. And, and it's this gentle passing away. And um, that's all linked in here to that final verse. Um, and gathering swallows twitter in the sky. Now, swallows migrate in winter so it's this idea of passing into death or you know what comes next and the romantic poets you know didn't necessarily believe in an afterlife but they also didn't know what existed the romantic poets celebrated the great mysteries of life um, so essentially what we have in this poem is we have this idea of the second half of an adult's life passing in from, you know, maturity to retirement, to old age, and then finally to death. And that's represented through the passing of the seasons from late summer, early autumn through to autumn, transcending into winter. Now, this poem is made even more powerful by the fact that Keats was dying when he wrote that. Whilst he may not have acknowledged or known for sure he was dying, he certainly would have known that he was very ill. So it makes it all the more powerful and emotional, actually, that he chose to view death in such a gentle, um, non-frightening way. And yes, there is a mournful, sad atmosphere compared to the start, which is very sort of positive with all this ripe fruit and summer. But it's not a sad poem either. And that's why we link it back to an elegy. This is a poem about death. This is a poem about the inevitable death we will all face. And whilst it may, may be mournful, it's not tragic and it's not depressing. And again, 
Keats felt in his short life, his 25 years, that he hadn't done anything to make himself a successful immortal poet. He felt that he would just be forgotten. And I always think it's very powerful to think that he was wrong. You know, in 2021, generations of students are still being forced to um, annotate his poetry. So finally, I'm going to upload the PowerPoint back again and just ask you to complete a final task and then we will be done. Remember, if you any of that annotation went too quick for you, do please feel free to to go back and pause it. So. Think about how Thank you. 